call this meeting to order at 5.35. Um, and we're now recording, perfect. All right, thank you, Jay. All right, um, first item on the agenda is approval of minutes. Um, the minutes, we have three minutes to approve from the regular meeting on April 21st, the special meeting on June 4th, and the special meeting on July 13th. Um, the minutes should be in the packet that you all received. all of them and I would approve I would put for a motion to approve the first two but I will abstain from the third because I was not here for that one let's just do them one at a time then I guess um, all right so motion by motion to approve the April 21st minutes yep. as presented second by Ed all right any discussion Okay, all members in favor, signify aye by raising your hand. Aye. 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 Any aye. abstentions or objections? All right, minutes pass unanimously. Uh, next would be an approval or a motion to approve the meeting, special meeting of June 4th. So moved. I'll second. Thanks, Karen. Any discussion? All right, all members in favor. Aye. 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 Any abstentions or objections? Okay, minutes pass. And then finally, a motion to pass the minutes of the meet special meeting on July 13th. I move we accept the meeting, the minutes for the July 13th meeting. I'll second. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, any discussion? All members in favor? Aye. Uh, any objections or? You know, I can be in favor as long as you guys approve. I can be in favor, right? Yes. yes. All right. Well, then I'm in favor. All right. <laughs> minutes pass. <laughs> All right. Thanks, guys. Um, through the minutes, let's go to public comment. Any public comment? All right, seeing no public, let's move to communication. Any communication from the board? Last chance, guys, for some communication here tonight. <laughs> All right, uh, seeing none, we'll move to new business, to the pension fund update. Uh, the gentleman from Webster, you guys have the floor. All right, thank you, David. Uh, let's turn to page three. I've updated the market and economic uh, news through June. Um, let me start out by saying that it, it appears that both the market and the economy are on different paths. Uh, as you've seen, the markets have charged higher, uh, primarily based on optimism of a successful reopening of the economy, uh, and certainly backed by an accommodative Fed and fiscal stimulus. So we've seen a, a quite a nice rebound off the March lows. You'll see that the S&P was up slightly over 20% for the quarter. Our international developed markets, the MSCI EPO was up nearly 15% for the quarter. And on the fixed income side, the intermediate gov <laughs> credit index was up 2.81%, uh, a little bit different than what we saw in the first quarter with the S&P and international markets substantially down uh, and the intermediate uh, government substantially up. So uh, quite a little bit of a reversal, but a nice rebound. Uh, 
looking at the economy, as I mentioned, completely different path. Uh, the news is, is not good. This is the damage that was sustained in March and April, part of February. Uh, initial weekly jobless claims have exceeded a million in each of the last 17 weeks. Uh, and continuing claims, although down from what we talked about um, in April, still at 17 plus million. Uh, and Q2 GDP forecast, and I think we talked about this briefly, we expected uh, a double digit contraction. That number could be as high as 40%. Uh, and Q2 earnings are also expected to decline double digits. So the news is is not good from a job standpoint, uh, from overall production, earnings, of course, everything is coming in quite poorly, uh, somewhat expected. Um, but we have a Fed that stands ready uh, to maintain its accommodative stance, keep uh, interest rates low, uh, launch lending programs, et cetera, all things to help uh, keep the economy going. Um, and Congress, uh, again, is considering a second round of stimulus. So we'll see what shape that takes. Uh, but nonetheless, there's discussions about uh, another round, uh, some of which the attributes would be quite similar to the first round, but maybe not as high or the numbers anyway. Um, Near-term outlook, uh, certainly the focus would be on the fiscal stimulus. Uh, remember the benefits that were included, uh, specifically the $600 a week in unemployment federal uh, subsidy uh, is set to expire at the end of the month. I want to say that it, it might be around July 25th or July 26th. I don't think it's the 31st, but nonetheless, um, close to expiring. So we're going to be in a situation, uh, unfortunately, where if that were to expire, it would come at a time where we're seeing a resurgence of coronavirus outbreak, especially in uh, the southern states like Florida. Um, so what that means, in our view, is that we're going to continue to see a lot of market volatility. Uh, there's going to be a lot of focus on what the stimulus package is, and of course, an eye towards you know, how bad this recent outbreak um, will have on the economy. Will we shut down? Will we not shut down? I mean, there's all types of talk, but what that creates is a lot of uncertainty in the market, and when we're uncertain, uh, we get a lot of fluctuations. So I would expect that we'll continue to see that through the summer months into the fall. Um, and really, it, it may not settle down until we really get a handle around when a vaccine or if a vaccine is developed uh, and when it will be available. So we could be in for uh, a little bit of more fluctuations than we probably care to see. Uh, and then, of course, we have, and we've mentioned this before, the impact of the upcoming elections for seeing a little bit more news about that now as we near uh, November. So you know, there's a lot of things that uh, remain to be seen. So, um, you know, it, it, again, it could be a little bit choppy. So with that, why don't I hand it off to Bob? We can go through what we did for the quarter. We got performance, of course, year to date, three, five, and inception. And you could talk a little bit about what we've done in the portfolio in light of uh, the recent uh, action mark. Sure. Thanks, Bob. Um, before we get into performance, if everybody would turn to page, <clears throat> excuse me, page six, um, we've added a new page to the presentation. And what this page shows is the um, asset allocation over the last four quarters and changes that have taken place, whether through market depreciation, appreciation, or just changes that we've made underneath the hood. Um, I think it's a good way to look at it graphically, um, but just to uh, pinpoint a few things that you can look at. If you look at the USA large cap, which is the top line as of Q4, uh, we are at 50.3% in market value. It was a little over 14.6 million. If you go to the Q1 2020 market value, you can see that the large cap value 
actually had fallen down to 47.7%. And that had nothing to do with trading. What that was was the S&P was down 19.60% in the first quarter of 2020, and it really dragged down the overall asset allocation of the large cap space. But if you fast forward and look to the Q2 of 2020, you can see that the market value of the S&P or the large cap had gone to 51.2% and was at 15.239 million. And part of that was the market push. We had 20.54% in the second quarter of 2020. But also I did a little bit of restructuring in the portfolio. And mainly what I did was if you go to the second line down and you look at the Q1 versus Q2 on the mid cap, you can see we were at 2.7 as of Q1 on the mid cap. And if I'm going too fast for anybody, please interrupt me and let me know if you can't follow along. Um, but you can see we had about $675,000 in market value. And then as of Q2 2020, we were down to 1% in the mid cap space. And what I did there was, is I trimmed the overall mid cap space. And what I did was I trimmed the passive approach that we had on the mid cap space. Um, I kept the active management and what I did is I took that 1.7% out of the uh, mid cap and I rolled that up into the large cap. Also in Q2, we had a contribution of 1.4 million to the overall plan. And I used about 625,000 of that as well to increase the large cap space to get it back over the 51%. Um, the only other thing that really stands out on this page is if you go down uh, under the Q1 of 2020, you'll see the second to very last uh, line item is alternatives. And <clears throat> under alternatives, that was our uh, fixed income manager that had the mandate to basically go anywhere. And um, we were just not comfortable anymore with his positioning. He was still around 65% cash um, and he was lagging the overall intermediate of credit index, which is the benchmark that we have. So what I did is I sold out of that alternative manager and I bought into the uh, Intermediate Gov Credit ETF just to get some more exposure to the overall index uh, so that we were a little bit tighter in duration and overall performance of the fixed income. Um, any questions or comments on this page? I, I think it's a really good page to really tell a story. Um, I just don't know how everybody feels about it. Hey Bob, well, I just... I don't want to interrupt here, but I apologize to everybody. I've been scouring my email and I can't find your, um, the booklet. I don't, what email was that in? Cause I don't seem to have it. I can share my screen if that's all. It came from Jason. Yeah, give me one second. I'm very sorry. No, don't be sorry. It's okay. Yeah, no. We've all worry. been there. <laughs> yeah. Right, I yeah, I don't know. Half ago. Oh, okay, I think I found it here. Uh, Jason, I believe sent it on. Uh, Gotta be calls you. No, I got it now. Thank you. I'm sorry. All right, okay. perfect. We're on uh, page six. Then six. Okay. But. David, Amy, Ed, any questions, concerns about this page? Do you think it offers value or? Yes, I no, think so. I love it. I like you it. You do? Okay, good. Yeah, I like it too. Good, great. And we, I see we added the pie charts with the colors, which I love. Okay. Yeah, I think I it really does tell, it's, it's an easy way to tell the story yeah. and um, exactly. it's, it's easy to read. Um, so if everybody's okay with that page, we can just turn to page, how did that happen? Uh, page five, sorry about that. Um, we can look at the uh, portfolio summary where it goes over the asset allocation. At the top left, you can see the overall equities are at 61.5% versus 60% on the target. So slightly overweight with 1.5%. Our fixed income is still underweight at 34.5 versus the target of 40 but we roll up the cash as fixed income because we do have benefit payments to pay. Um, so between the two, it's at 38.5%. So we're not really too far underweight on the fixed income. But the bottom right will show you where we started the year, the third number down, which includes accrued income. 
So we started with 29110000 And then after the contributions, the withdrawals, fees, and income and market appreciation, we ended with, excuse me, 29754000 So we were minus 0.19% year to date. As of last night, the market value was thirty million five hundred eighty-nine thousand. Um, so um, we are having one of the best Julys since two thousand thirteen. The S and P is now positive for the year. Through June thirtieth, the S and P was negative three point zero eight percent year to date, and now it is positive. So we're up over four percent in the month of July. Um, <clears throat> so I'm showing you year to date here, but if you look at um, the difference in quarters, uh, Q1, we were down about 12.69%. It was a drawdown of a little over 3.7 million. And then in Q2, we came back uh, on a total portfolio basis of 14.32% and we were up 3.5 million. So we were almost flat year to date. Um, any questions on any of that? Okay, um, if everybody would turn to page 10 and go through performance. So I showed you year to date, but if we can look at the quarter, which is the first column, the total portfolio is up 14.32%, benchmarks at 13, and then total portfolio net fees is at 14.21. Um, the equities, which includes mid and small, along with the large cap um, and international, will show you that we did 21.78%. Our domestic equities, which is large, mid, and small, did 22.39 versus the S&P of 20 and a half. And our international did 16.87. And then fixed income, um, by adding to the intermediate of credit, and having the Fed come in and start to buy some corporate bonds, including Ginny Mays and also high yield, it also helped, helped us on our uh, short-term duration on fixed income that we had the Lord Abbott, which is a bank loan debt. Um, so we, we did a little bit better than the benchmark on a fixed income year, quarter to date. We are still lagging on the um, year to date on the fixed income, and that's just mainly due because I was short duration um, and I just I didn't anticipate rates to fall as low as they did. Um, but I think the way I've repositioned a portfolio, and you can see it's only a three month number, but I think going forward, we're going to be much more in line with the overall benchmark on the fixed income side. But if you look on the year to date number under domestic equities, you can see our domestic equities were almost off 1% versus the S&P uh, down three. And then even on the one year number, our domestic equities continue to outperform the S&P 500, 861 versus 751. Um, international continues out to perform the benchmark. We're at minus 0.05 versus 5%. And then I won't read all the numbers to you, but across the board, we've basically, basically either in line with the benchmark or outperforming in every time period. The only uh, index that we lagged was the fixed income, and that's, that's what uh, hurt performance a little bit across the board. Um, I mean, it's not bad at all by any means. You can still see on the five-year number, um, total portfolio is up 7.22%, and even net of fees were still at 6.81 annualized. Um, so over the last five years, each year, this portfolio has done 6.81% after fees. Any questions at all on that page? Nope. Nope. Okay. I've been uh, shaking um, my head no, thinking that you're logged into the video <laughs> and that sorry. you can see us all saying that we don't have questions. <laughs> okay. Um, if you go to page 11, um, I actually like this report a lot too. Um, what I, I told you that the first page, the new page, you know, it told a story, but this actually shows you what we did underneath the hood. Um, if you look at page 11 and the second column in is called net flows. Um, I told you I added to uh, the large cap space. You can see that I added to the Fidelity Contra Fund under net flows, I put 320, basically $327,000 into the fund. I added almost $300,000 to the S&P 500. 
And one thing we've always been talking about since we started managing the money for you guys is that we try to use active management in certain spots that we think we can add value. And if you look at the Fidelity Contra Fund, the top line, um, and you go all the way to the right, the fourth column to the last, you can see the return for this fund uh, year to date. This fund is up 9.54% in a market where the S&P is actually down 3.4 year to date. So it's outperformed the S&P 500 by almost 1,300 basis points year to date. Um, and that's where I think we add a, a lot of value for you. Um, we do a, a huge screening process, uh, a lot of due diligence on our managers, and we continue to try to find a, gen a way to generate alpha in different uh, asset classes. Um, on the mid-cap side, I did tell you I sold out of the passive uh, management of the Russell mid-cap. You can see that I sold $548,000 under the net flows. Um, I did trim small cap during the year. Um, and part of that was I wanted to add more to the fixed income. And what I did was I added to the intermediate gov credit ETF. But I, again, I sold the passive fund. Um, but if you look down below that, it says assets purchased and assets sold during the period under small cap. And one thing that we always try to do is always try to keep expense ratios very low for, you, for all of our clients. Um, but because of the size of the relationship that we have with JP Morgan, um, we were able to get into a lower share class fund. So it says that we sold uh, the JP Morgan small cap equity and we bought uh, the JP Morgan small cap equity. But what we all, all we actually did was interchange in between share classes. So we kept the same fund, we just got a lower expense ratio overall. Um, there was no changes on the international side. Page 12, if you're all still with me, um, you can see, like I've said, um, I added to the iShares Intermediate Gov Credit ETF. That's gonna get us much closer to the overall benchmark. Um, I added almost $2 million. I added $1.9 million to that fund. Um, throughout the rest of the year, we have several bonds maturing. It's going to be about $600,000 by the end of the year, um, the individual bonds that are maturing. And um, my inclination is to add more to this intermediate gov credit and possibly add a little bit more to high yield. Um, and the reason for the high yield addition would be because, um, like Bob mentioned, the, the Fed is doing everything they possibly can to keep the economy going. And um, they're really, I think they're putting a floor in the, in the um, credit quality space of the fixed income. And I don't think there's really too much downside, especially with them buying high yield bonds um, throughout the year. So that's just a thought. Um, other than that, there have been, there has not been many changes other than on page 13, you can see I did sell that JP Morgan strategic income opportunities, which was about a $618,000 position. And if nobody doesn't have a question, we can continue on to the OPEB, <clears throat> unless someone has a question. Okay. And again, I can't see you. Okay, so page 15 takes us to the OPEB. A um, little bit slightly higher equity position. We have 62.6, 32% um, in, in fixed. Uh, lower in cash, 2.7. We still have a little bit of the alternative manager of 2.3. And the reason for that, um, that I kept the alternative manager in there is we had a little bit, we had a different funds on the fixed income side in the OPEB versus the um, the pension plan. And the um, the fund managers that I had in the OPEB have a little bit of a longer duration than the uh, managers that we had in the um, the pension. So um, I'm just trying to balance the overall duration of the portfolio so that it's pretty similar. Um, but if you look at the bottom right-hand side, you can see where we started, basically 1.3 million. And then after all the contributions, withdrawals, fees, and everything else, we ended with 1,351,000. Um, as of last night, we were at 1,396,000. Um, so we finished at minus 0.98 year to date. Um, if you want to go to page 18, that just shows you the overall performance of the portfolio. A quarter to date, we are up 15.14. A 
like I said, minus 0.98. And then you can see the one, three, and inception. So the last three years were at 7.11. And again, that's annualized. And you can see that our domestic equities continue to either outperform or in line with the Russell 3000, which is more of a, an apples to apples comparison in this portfolio because it does have mid and small versus just comparing everything to the S&P 500. And then again, uh, starting on page 19, you can just see little moves I've made in the portfolio. I added again, some to the Fidelity Contra Fund, some to the S&P 500, just to maintain the slightly overweight in the equity component. Um, I did, we did, again, on the large cap side, because of our relationship with JP Morgan, we were able to get a cheaper, S, uh, cheaper share class. So again, we, on this side, this was a large cap. We were able to sell out of the JP Morgan equity income on one share class and get a cheaper one. And then um, other than that, the only other changes on page 20, I added some more to the iShares Intermediate uh, Credit. And again, that was just to get closer to the overall benchmark um, for duration purposes and performance purposes as well. Um, awesome, yeah, thanks. Sure. Looks good, um, any questions okay. guys? What's the assumption that we're using right now for our pension growth? Six and a half or 6.25 or something in between? Yeah, I believe that it's 6.5, but I'd have to defer to Amy. <clears throat> I, know we're gonna split the difference I think we split the difference and went to 6.375. We okay. did. Oh, okay. All right. Um, right? Because we want, they wanted us to go, Becky wanted us to go to 6.25. Correct. Didn't want to go there. But we also had to change the mortality and something else. So I think we're doing so a, a two-step down. Like it's right. yeah, yeah, it's over two yeah. years. We're still. I, I'm just looking at the per, overall performance last three years, and we're up over seven. So our yeah. six point five, six point three seven, six point two five. Um, we're we're ahead of that which is always that's a good thing we're we're making more than we anticipated we would make so we've got a little bit of extra going in <clears throat> we're building yeah, some yeah. It, it's a good asset allocation when we develop this um and it was a, quite a long time ago now but you could see that you know basically a 60 40 is a, a nice sweet spot for a pension plan where you can get the type of return you need to meet the uh, the actuary's expectations or, or the calculations, and then also grow the portfolio. So, you know, it's worked out. I mean, we pay more attention to the five in the inception and you can see that, you know, the numbers are well above uh, what we're looking to get. So, and it's been a good market too, you know, so. That's, that's a statement that's really hard to believe. It's been a good market <clears throat> with the, the roller coaster ride that we've been on. And yet, th this afternoon, I was looking at your asset allocation, your pie chart thing, <clears throat> and it really hasn't changed from a year ago. Uh, a, a slight minor adjustments, a little bit, but not a big deal. No, it looks like no knee jerk, get out of this market, get into this market kind of thing. We just sort of, I don't know, took out the sandpaper and roughed the edges a little bit. Um, do you think? That the I, I know I know I know, but do you think the environment that we're in now is something that we can depend on? I, I get the impression we're being held up by federal money. Well, um, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Bob. Oh, oh no, right. I, no, I, I mean our our belief is if it wasn't for the Fed right now, the economy would be a lot worse than it is. Oh no, doubt. Um, they're doing yeah, they're doing everything possible to keep it going. Um, and the way, I mean, Bob, Bob talked about weekly jobless claims a little while ago. Um, and if you look at it, the new weekly jobless claims, Bob said, you know, has been over a million dollars a week for the last 17 weeks. But if you look over the last 15, 15 consecutive weeks, it's been coming down. And then if you look at the continuous claims, 
Um, they've they actually they're still at 17.3 million, which is extremely high. But it fell by 422 thousand dollars since the last um, continuing claims count, um, which gives us some hope that there is going to be a rebound in the labor market. It's just hopefully you know, they don't open up the economies too soon and we have another second wave of this COVID. Um, yeah. But I, I think I think the economy's chugging along a lot better than anybody anticipated. And I think the recovery from this recession, because like Bob said, we are now in a double digit contraction in the second quarter GDP, which by definition, a recession is two consecutive negative quarters of GDP. We finally got that. Um, I, I think the economy is doing a lot better than anybody anticipated. And if we get some sort of resolution or some sort of vaccine to this COVID-19, I think this, this market's really going to take off. And um, like we tell you know, most of our clients, we, we never try to time the market. We always try to stay either neutral, or slightly underweight or overweight equities. And I think the way we have the, the portfolio positioned right now, and where we think the the market and the economy is headed, I think it's perfect. Yeah, yeah, we went neutral Ed like last year. Um, yeah, we had a big market run up, and a lot of that was on the thumb, right? It was we're going to settle this thing with China, and we're going to get back to you know big growth, big GDP numbers. So we looked at that and said that, well, that's a lot to bank on the come, um, and the market pushed so high that we, we kind of went from overweight to a neutral weight and we stayed that way for a while and then COVID came and no one saw that coming so um, you know it helped but I mean we've always taken a long-term view so and as Bob mentioned if we start with neutral we think the targets are appropriate and we overweight when we feel confident that it's the right thing to do and underweight when we feel that that's the right thing to do. So, you know, asset allocation is really a primary driver of performance. So, and, um, you know, our guys do a pretty good job when it comes to asset allocation. So. I'm, I'm happy you. with the performance of this thing, and I'm actually even a little bit more happy to hear you guys talk about it. I was just afraid that we were artificially propped up and it was going to be, the balloon was going to pop. And we were going to crash like a stone. It may be offset yeah. the lift in the economy in general if we can get some of these people back to work. If we can take care of this virus. Yeah, exactly. And you know that is a focus. Uh, remember, the market's forward thinking. Right. right. So what we see today is we're looking six to nine months out. So the market's saying we'll have a vaccine at that point, and we've already restarted the economy. And yeah, there's been some setbacks, but we're looking past that. So that's an optimistic view. So we're not that optimistic, right? We're still around neutral. If we were that optimistic, we'd be overweight more not. So, and I hope that's the case, but you always have to think about the other side and say, well, that might not come as close as one expected. So expectations and actual will be different always. So, and we're seeing, unfortunately, a rise in cases in Florida, Texas, and most throughout the southern states. So it, you know, it's, there's some headwinds out there. So you got to be conscious of that too. But right now the market's been shrugging it off. As Bob mentioned, July, you know, continues to charge higher. So, but I, I guess, so I wouldn't be surprised or we were not surprised if we're more range bound at least for the remainder of the summer. So, and, and we'll see. Then, then we'll see what happens. And and every month or week that goes by, we're hopefully one week or a month closer to more clarity around a vaccine and when it can be implemented and whether it works. So, uh, you know, time time will tell. But, yeah. you know, we're watching. We're watching and we're ready to, um, you know, do what we need to do, though. it's We haven't been very tactical, and you've seen that even through the asset allocation pie charts. So, and that's a by design at this point. I had a question. Shoot. Um, 
the investment policy statement, I know we had discussions. We came up with a, a red line that I think the committee liked but wanted council to review. I was just curious, is that underway? Uh, so this is Amy. To... Uh, it was discussed in October to send to George. It was sent to George. He wanted a word version. We got him a word version. I didn't hear anything. I sent it again in May. Um, still haven't heard anything. Sent something a couple weeks ago, asking him if he ever reviewed it, and uh, still haven't heard. Okay. All right. Yeah, well, I have a feeling that's kind of taken a back burner to some of the other uh, DB stuff that's been going on. Um, yeah. But that's oh, a, no, that's I was going to bring that up too because I see it's on the agenda upcoming. Um, so that might at this point have to be for next meeting because we still don't have it back yet from George. Okay, it's not critical. I mean, you know, we made modest changes to the IPS statement. It was really around increasing the international exposure, redefining the benchmarks so that it was more uh, diversified, include more asset classes, um, and really just to bring the asset allocation parameters to one page in a grid format. So it was easier to follow, yeah. make sure that we were in compliance for you guys. Absolutely. Yep. Period. Um, is there any other questions from the board as it pertains to the performance update of the plan investments. I have none. Um, I next on the item is the fiduciary uh, 321 RFP analysis. So, gentlemen, I don't know if you want to hang out for that for a second. Um, yeah, I'll we stay on that. It. So, yeah, I would anticipate that we're probably going to vote on this tonight or next. Okay. Yeah, I'd like to stay on that if I don't mind. Great. All right. Um, so moving on then to the next piece of new business is the defined contribution 401A457-321 uh, fiduciary services RFP analysis. So Amy did one of these great spreadsheets that she does, which has all the details of uh, the different plans that we have is a quick reminder for everyone on the board. This is really just having a fiduciary put a second set of eyes on the fund lineup in the, um, the DC plans that we have. So the, the plans that they contribute to, not the pension plan. So that's what ICMA has taken over. And they have a list of mutual funds and ETFs um, that they vetted and have provided to all of our folks, you know, that they can choose to invest in. It's very similar to like your 401k list of fund options. We have a similar thing for our plan. Um, it's been recommended that we have ongoing fiduciary kind of review of those plan investment options that are available. ICMA, uh, you know, doesn't do that ongoing, but they have a third party that's uh, MISRO. So we did another RFP and what you can see is we've gotten responses back from ICMA, fiduciary investment advisors, Hokan Holcomb, and uh, the gentleman at Webster have reached out to a division that does this as well. Um, Realistically, my goal on this would probably be to get it done in the most cost effective way possible because these are all big common funds and ETFs that are available within the plan. Like there's, there's not any exotic offerings um, in there. So it's pretty standard and it's just making sure that nothing goes wrong with any of them. Um, so if you see in that sheet, does everyone have this? Yes. Okay. Um, uh, what we have is ICMRA at 20 basis points, well, a little over $11,000. Fiduciary investment advisors at 10,000. Hooker and Holcomb at 12,000. And 
Uh, Webster has been able to do it at 10 basis points, so that comes out to around 5,500. Any questions on this? David, I have two. Yeah. Um, where it says whether they'll be acting as the fiduciary for the Webster, it says if LPL and investment advisor representative, which is this Burt guy, are granted discretion with respect to the management of the client assets. Um, is that where they're picking? I guess was my question. That discretionary usually means they're doing it, kind of like what Webster Bank does for us on the DB plan right now. So I wasn't quite sure if that statement meant that they were picking the funds versus just reviewing the ones we already have with ICMA. Um, I don't know if either of the Bobs would know that because it is like, does that assume that they would be able to choose and like, how broad is the discretion going to be there? Because does it mean just with respect to the list of available funds from ICMA or is it more broad based? Do you guys yeah, happen dude, to know? I'd, yeah, I'd have to ask Bert. Um, how that works. My sense of it is, is that it is um, the menu of funds that are available. They'll make recommendations and, and those recommendations would have to be approved by the committee. So I'm not sure what they mean by discretion. And I agree with, you know, Amy, we have discretion. We look at the managers, we're picking them, we're telling you what we're doing. Yeah. I don't see that that's quite the same arrangement. So I will ask Bert what that means if LPL, I mean, LPL is the platform. You're yep. familiar with them and he's the advisor. So I'll ask him specifically, what do you mean by discretion? And I'll have him email Amy Perfect. Uh, with a response. That way you can get that out. Okay, Amy, was there a second question? Well, just their little light on, they don't have five municipal clients. Um, there, lots of their list is not municipalities and they listed three municipalities with Litchfield being uh, just one year and Watertown and Middlebury being five years. So clearly he hasn't been doing this very long tied to municipalities. Um, so that would be the only other question I would have is the length of service with the other couple of municipalities that he does have. Amy, this is Jason. Based on our conversation earlier, does that make a material difference in terms of um, yeah. what it is they do? And I don't know. <laughs> I, I'm not on that side of it, so I don't know a lot about the investment world. Um, I don't think, because if they're just choosing like the best funds or the most suitable funds from a fund lineup, there really wouldn't, I agree with Jason, there wouldn't be a material difference if you did that for a private company or for a public company, because, you know, really your only objective is to make sure that they're suitable. Right, and that we're offering valid funds, obviously. Exactly, yeah. So I so don't know. Those were my only two things that jumped out at me. Um, okay. First being obviously the discretion and what's that mean? I mean, Yep. Obviously, we're tied in with ICMA and what they can do. So it's not like they can have free reign. Yeah, because exactly. An ICMA has to be able to manage it. And ICMA yeah, yeah. have to offer it. They're basically Correct. the oversteer yeah. of the menu that's given to them. Yes, except they're not willing to do the fiduciary research once they give us that list. So this whole thing came up when George said to me, Okay, I've reviewed all your ICMA documents, so who's your fiduciary? And I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, oh, they did all the fiduciary work to give you a lineup, but they're not willing to ongoing do it. <coughs> so that's how we got into this spot a year ago when yep. we went to them in May of 2019. So, uh, so that's all. And I'm fine with whatever you guys choose. That was my only concern is what discretionary meant. Is it going to conflict with ICMA? That's all. Okay. So yeah, glad you guys stayed on. I think um, getting just a little more clarity 
around that discretion that he would like would be right. helpful because obviously, you know, we want to keep that at ICMA. We just moved everything there. Um, A new station alert has arrived. And again, it's like, I can't imagine that there's, you know, a whole ton of work involved in this. Um, I get the impression they're going to be looking for the losers. They're, I, they're not, I don't think they're going to tell us who the best is. They're going to tell us that this one's a dog and we need to get out of it. Exactly. I mean, that's really their job. Their job is to look at our lineup and see if there's something going south and let us know that that's something we shouldn't be offering our people because then we're not doing our fiduciary responsibility to our employees. That's really all it's about. Yeah, they're not if picking, there's they're something not, we should I don't be think they're out looking to pick the winners. I think they're looking to throw out the dead wood. Right. Well, we're gonna monitor all the funds and, I, and this is my past life, so I'm familiar with the process. Um, and I've shared my work with Bert <laughs> before. You know, they moved all the 401ks over to his world. I had some, even with Webster. So you're really monitoring all the managers that are part of the menu. And you develop a scoring system uh, based on 10, 12, maybe 15 different metrics. And each metric is scored each quarter and tracked quarter to quarter to quarter to quarter. And the criteria will be you need to you know, score a, a seven or an eight in every metric in every quarter, and you'll receive a, a green color. And if your score is below, say, a seven, or maybe it was a six or a five, you won't make that metric and won't track that, not just for the current quarter, not the next quarter, but for the previous quarters. And then we'll report it to you and say, hey, here's here's the criteria, here's the 12, and I'm, I'm guessing I'm the 12, I don't know if it's 10, 12, or 15, but whatever, here's the scores on the different criteria, it's added up for each manager, good and bad, everybody gets equal scoring, and then a report gets spit out so you know, because even the best managers will have times, depending on market conditions, where they don't perform as well. Like right now, value. So sometimes bad scores don't necessarily mean that the fund is bad. You have to really do more qualitative analysis. So this process does that for you. It gives you both quantitative and qualitative analysis of all the underlying funds that are in the menu. And they will work with whatever the stable is. They work with other companies too. Not just ICMA, Fidelity, there's others. And they all have, you know, a gazillion funds that can be used. So that's really part of it. I've always liked the report that they do there. I think you'll like it too. Should we get the engagement? Awesome. Yeah. So, well, it's good you guys stayed. Um, that's a good takeaway. So I guess we'll probably have to table that till next meeting. Okay. Well, I'll get that uh, email out to Bert. Yeah, I appreciate it. Unless there's any other comments or questions from anyone else. The only thing I would say is if we have a need to meet relating to any of the negotiations going on, that maybe we could do it sooner than waiting until um, October. I'm sure it will come up. <laughs> All right. Um, Guys, I think that's all we have for you tonight. So uh, thanks for joining. You know, appreciate your time as always. All right. Thank well, you thanks for the time. Enjoy the rest of the summer. Take care. All right. Um, obviously, we already discussed the uh, defined benefit investment policy statement. Um, if you want to. Amy, that would be a good thing. If we could try to get that and the uh, the fiduciary done together, that could be a, uh, a good reason to add something to an agenda to meet a little sooner than October and get those two things knocked out. Do we really have to wait on the fiduciary thing? Um, that is a good point Amy brought up. I didn't see that, but 
it says that because we need a statement confirming that they're a fiduciary and they say to only provide that if they're granted discretionary and like it's a little vague how it's worded so i think it's appropriate to get a little more clarity just to make sure that they don't say oh well you know we'll take our fee and you know next year well we recommend that you move it to our platform and we're not going to give you the statement unless you do that because we don't like this lineup anymore. Okay. It's, it's worth getting the clarification. Yeah. And we'll still have to pull up anyway on the, um, the DB investment policy statement. So um, that's fine. And honestly, I don't think that we'll have any action on this next item, but this came up. Um, in the negotiation team and it's something that uh the attorney josh could recommend that we have in open sessions it's more of a policy and it probably is going to involve the board of selectmen as well because i think it's pretty broad uh based but the crux of it is should we have a policy that sets some sort of sort of standard for when someone moves from one bargaining unit or one position within the town to another. So say they move from a police uh, or a clerical position to a police position, you know, what happens to their retirement benefits? And then vice versa. What if someone is a police officer and they move into a clerical position what sort of retirement benefits would they be entitled to? Because um, we essentially, what we have found out is that this has been determined on kind of a case by case basis in the past. And we should probably have some sort of uh, formalized policy as to you know what we do in those scenarios. Does that make sense? Did I? Any questions yeah. on that? Yeah. Well, the only thing I would add is that what we're seeing is someone leaves an unaffiliated position, which has a DB plan. They move to a clerical <laughs> position, which is now DC. So as we've spread the unions out between what's DB and what's DC, so we've had that issue. And the question is, does it work the other way? Somebody comes in as a clerical, starts as a DC, and then moves to the supervisor position that's now back on the DB. So we're having some, as people move around, now that the different retirement plans are available for different bargaining units, um, that question has come up. Apparently it came up a long time ago with a dispatcher who left clerical as a DB, went to a dispatcher which was on the DC and got to keep their DB plan, which happened way back in the early 2000s. So the question keeps coming up, but it seems like every time it happens, it ends up being the benefit of the employee. If they were DC and they went to a plan with DB, they got to go to the DB. If they were already DB and they went to a place with DC, they got to keep their DB. So it seems like it's always happening to the detriment of the town with the employee keeping the better of the plans. So now that we've spread them out farther, I think we just really need to take a hard look at the whole overall picture. And this isn't to say that we always want to make it, you know, not good for the employee, because a lot of times that can be a retention key, uh, you know, a retention piece of, you know, and you don't want to kind of stymie someone's promotion or growth in role. But it's also worrisome from the other side, like, if we don't have a set um, policy, like, you can grant exceptions to a policy, but if everything's done by exception, like if somebody is in, you know, the Board of Selectmen's office who doesn't like an employee, you know, theoretically they could treat them much differently. I think it just adds some nice kind of layers of protection to the town in a bunch of different ways. Totally agree. Are yeah. we subject to discussion on that? So we'll, we wanted to, yeah, obviously we're subject to discussion. We wanted to kind of get the thoughts of the board. Um, I think that, you know, we should be having this 
discussion in an open dialogue as to you know what's a fair and appropriate kind of way to start thinking about this um, and then probably work you know in conjunction obviously with Jason and the selectman's office and the board of selectmen to probably get something um, in writing that's at least some sort of policy. Ladies, any thoughts, Karen? Karen? Yeah, I think it's good to have a policy where it's it's not discretionary. I think it's it's probably the way to go. Yeah, I think if you tie it somehow to length of service, so that if someone was here longer, they would have more flexibility, a better option. Um, then yeah, but it just you know, because if you were to go take a job in a different place you would still be subject to what their offerings are. So if you're moving around, yeah, it's with the same town and we can be nice and we like you and all that, but at the same time, we have to be responsible with our money. We yeah. have to be responsible to other people in that same position working right next, right alongside That's the same it. too, yeah. You know, if, if I'm coming, my thought here, and, and I'm just, I haven't spent weeks thinking about this, I've spent seconds. But if I've got a DB plan right now and I have an opportunity to change jobs to a DC, that DC plan is part of my job change. I'm, I'm looking at that as that's something that I really should, I need to consider the whole thing. What am I getting? What am I giving? My DB in my perfect world would be frozen. Yeah. Tomorrow I start the DC and I start in the DC world because that's what everybody else is getting in that, in that position. I agree. And I think like something standardized where when you go to a new job unit, you assume the um, plan of that unit, because generally, I think that we have tried to, you know, um, more, de you know, there, there is stuff that goes into it, you know, a more physically demanding job, I think, you know, there's a higher likelihood that there's, you know, a DB plan or a hybrid, because obviously, that factors in a lot of the disability and you know the other benefits that those people have but you know if you leave that job and go to uh you know a part-time job where you know the demands aren't as high possibly like should you still be entitled to that you know uh richer benefit yeah i i and i would say probably not and if you went across the river to windsor locks and applied for that exact same position that you're applying for right now you would be offered whatever the benefit is in that Windsor Locks job. They wouldn't sit there and say, well, we'll give you a hybrid, we'll give you one of these, you can keep the old. This is the package. Take yeah. it or we'll go to the other guy. Now, and then, Jay, think, Jay, if you're still there, you might have some issues with that because, I don't know, it might, might be a slight disincentive, certainly not an advantage, perhaps, especially going from a DB to a DC. It could be a significant disincentive. So, so here's a real world example, and it, it um, doesn't hold water at the moment, but um, we recently had, recently is in the last couple of years, had somebody move from uh, an administrative assistant position in the clerical union to a zoning enforcement position in the supervisor's union. The pay differential was something in the ballpark of $7,000. Um, but if, you, if you're going from a, if, if the circumstance had been that you were going from a DB at 55,000 to a DC at 62,000, that person may not have, have decided to make that uh, upward mobility happen. Now, granted, that's not the exact circumstance that happened and employees no longer with us anyway, but um, nonetheless, it does pr seem to present the potential for some reconsideration for upward mobility. And as you may or may not recall, Dad, um, I uh, did my capstone for my master's on employee motivation and having, um, having a career ladder is a significant motivator, more so than, than salary is. So by, by putting um, a disincentive towards that upwards mobility, it has an adverse impact on uh, motivation. I'm not giving them a disincentive. I'm giving them a new benefit package. So they need to look at 
the job, the pay, the responsibilities, and the benefits associated with that new job to make that decision. And if I'm going to sound like a real hard ass here, but if you don't want that package, you don't have to take it. You can stay where you are or you can go to Windsor Locks, but somebody is going to get this package and we're not going to discriminate you on you for you to not do the same thing for the guy that's applying from out of town. Well, I think that's open to some kind of legal thing if somebody got wind of it. I mean, I would just say it, the fact that we would have a policy wouldn't prevent you from making an exception and saying, hey, this is someone who, you know, is really valuable to the organization. They know our systems, um, you know, and they've showed interest in getting to this next job, but there's this hang up. So as part of the offer, we're going to make this exception for them in this case. Like, you know, this wouldn't prevent you from doing that. I think the only issue I have right now is that everything is done on an exception basis and there should be some sort of standard policy. And I'd be willing to bet that the exception was perhaps what is best for the employee applicant or what's the least amount of ruffles that I'm going to, you know, how do I make this happen as the person higher up? Yeah, sure. We'll just give it to you. And I think that's wrong. Uh, you yeah. know, it's, it should not be a concession. I, I do believe that a policy should be enforced, but I'm actually not a big fan of with the possibility of an exception. I yeah, think I'm not even thinking about it because exception sets precedent and precedent gives you uh, openings for lawsuits. Yeah. How come you didn't give me that exception? Yeah. You know, you got it. I didn't get it. Yeah. What's the what's the big deal? Why? What's the special connection that you have that I don't have? I just think that it's not good policy to allow that exception. Because if you're going to make a policy, make a policy. And like, if you want to build into that policy, like if it's somebody for longevity, you'd have to write it into the policy. But don't make a policy that you are later going to make an exception to. I agree. With the intent of making exceptions to it, right. then what's the point of making a policy? Sure. So here's another um, question. Um, we had an employee, we have an employee uh, who works in records at the police department. Um, that employee was hired in the clerical union, which gets benefit package A. Through the course of negotiations between the uh, clerical union and the supervisor's union, and because of some other things that were happening that precipitated the change, that position was reclassified from a clerical position to a supervisor's position with a different set of benefits. So how do you handle that circumstance? I'm gonna guess that when you went from clerical to supervisor, the benefits were and they were enhanced. It was not a downgrade. It was probably an upgrade. It was a, it was an upgrade. I'll take it. It's part of my new job, the way you classified it. I, I'm sorry. I keep getting kicked off. We were just talking about you. It's all right. Oh. It was all sparkly and wonderful, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I mean, I also think that we obviously want to have the Board of Selectmen involved in this because it does kind of cross that boundary into labor and, you know, pension. But um, I don't know, Jay, what do you think? What would be the next best step for us? Uh, if there's consensus among the group for bullets of what that policy would contain, um, I can draft it up. Or, or have the attorney draft it up and run it by both boards in a draft form. Do we have, well, I mean, are you asking, have we built, put something together? Yeah, I'm, I'm saying if there's a general agreement on basically how you would want to structure it, then yeah. I'll have it drafted. Well, I agree with Ed. I think that I don't like exceptions. I think if you have a policy, you follow it. 
And I think the benefit should go with the position. I agree. All right, so it sounds like we would be interested in something that is essentially when you change positions, you assume the retirement plan of the new position that you are moving. If you're an in-house employee, in my mind, whatever I had today is frozen. Tomorrow when I start the new job, I start the new job with the new benefit package. Amy, is that has, so that, that impacts multipliers and um, retirement eligibility and years of service and all that. Yep. I would never take that job. Well, well it, it depends. Job, if if not, you were going from a clerical to supervisors, you're going to take it in heartbeat. Exactly. Because you're going from a DC to a DB. Um, if you want to go from um, uh, unaffiliated to a clerical union where they have a DC, then you're not going to want to take that. And it may have prevented if the person who went from clerical to dispatch, that person may not have taken it if they couldn't take their DB with them. I guess the only thing you have to worry about is um, the vested ones. If they're already vested, I guess that would be the years of service, five years or 10 years, whatever. So that would have a huge impact on somebody choosing to move or not. Well, we're not preventing them from moving. Those are just the rules if you decide to move. If you want to, and, and I'm not going to go from a supervisor job to a clerical position unless there's something really wrong here, you know, and I'm looking for a lifeboat to get before I retire or leave. That's, I mean, if that's I'm going to take one of those positions, I'm going to be in, my benefits should have been enhanced. Otherwise, it's not worth me taking it. Pay me more money, but give me less benefits. I may not want that. And, and I'm okay with that. I just, it's not attractive to me. So go put an ad in the paper and hire somebody else. Like I, I would say, I'm leaning towards Ed's. Not leaning. I'm, 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 I'm with Ed on that. Okay, Karen. Any other thoughts? No, I, I agree. I think that's just the way it should be. It, it just seems fair, not only to this applicant in motion, but to everybody else in the system. You get what you're whatever you're classified at, that's what you get. You don't get more, you don't get less. We're not taking anything away. Now, granted, if you're going from a DB to a DC, we are gonna take something away, but you know that when you take that new position. We're not changing the rules in the middle of the game. You're starting a new game. Yeah. How do you handle those employees who have made that change and had to buy up into a different plan? I think you leave them alone. This is a- this Yeah, is this is gonna be prospective. I don't think we can go back at this point. No. So I will share with the other employee that went from unaffiliated to clerical. I had that conversation and said, you are not getting your DB plan. And she said, oh yes, I am. Here's my MOU from Bob. <laughs> because I felt that they should have gone to DC. Um, if you were choosing to go from unaffiliated to a contract that had a DC plan for a couple years by then, um, that was my feeling was that it should you should be sticking with you can't always just get the good when you go from clerical to supervisors and you go back to a db plan great for you but you can't always just get the good yeah and hey, now that we are so split amongst all the different places um with what kind of benefits they're getting i just think it's one of those things that we, we you should get what your contract says Otherwise, what's the point of having a contract? With an exception. So I want the exception. No, no exception. All right. So I think that's the uh, the feel. So Jason, yeah, let's get Josh to kind of put together a draft. Um, you know, we can bring it back. And obviously, uh, the Board of Selectmen needs to weigh in on this as well. Or Selectman will set it. It's a, a policy decision, so that they're the policy making board. Um, the other thing is, I'm not sure that we'll, uh, it, 
if we'll have to negotiate it or not. This, okay. Amy can correct me if I'm wrong, but this feels to me like it's impact bargaining. I don't, I, I don't think so. I, don't I mean, their contracts are what their contracts are and they've agreed to those contracts. I mean, because somebody wants to move from one place to another, that's really, like I said, that's not on us, that's on them. I think we just have to be careful how we present the job to somebody who's looking to change jobs that we let them know that here's the clerical union contract this is the position you're applying for and this is what it comes with versus selling them that a hey, your db don't worry about it you can stay i i get the impression that those exceptions were made because it was the easy path to take i, I think don't so. want to start a fight i don't want to get into it i may not even have known what i was doing when i said yes <laughs> Let's just get this over with because I've got other fish to fry. Okay, what's next? Uh, I just think that it was handled poorly in the past, and I would, I would, I would feel more from a position of of a defensible position with a policy that said what we've been talking about. All right, so let's get uh, Josh to have his thoughts on what boards or board needs to approve this and what a draft would look like. And um, let's go from there. In the sequence. Sorry? In the sequencing. Yes. Yep. So let's just get this on his plate and see, you know, what he thinks uh, now that we've had, you know, the discussion. Who's that? Papa. <laughs> I, 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 we have a meeting crasher. <laughs> All right, guys. Um, since there's no old business, I, and again, all these are kind of blurring together right now. Is there any need for us to go into executive session, Jay? I don't have anything new, no. Mm -hmm. I don't think so either. Um, where, you know, anything as it relates to negotiations haven't moved much since our last meeting. And um, I would Well, the update would be that um, Capen, we're getting a settlement agreement with and he's taking the disability retirement. And um, that that's clerical- still, That's still his executive. Okay, I, why? We made a motion to approve it. It is an unresolved uh, settlement. That may change. Oh, oh he okay. It off. Yeah. And then clerical, we have an agreement with them for their pension. Yeah, but we already voted on that agreement. So again, yeah, no. Um, I think we're all set for tonight, guys. Well, the only other thing on upcoming negotiations is we're looking for a, a date for um, police pension negotiations and. Per the charter on the negotiating team, we need to have a member of the Board of Finance on that team. So that would either be Karen or Bill. Um, so I, I have, since we've been on the phone, I've circulated uh, an email with the dates in there to both Karen and Bill, because I just, one of them. Okay. And I have a quick comment. This fiduciary thing, which uh, to be honest, I'm not like, terrified of not having one but i would feel more comfortable if we did i don't think it's necessary to blow this off until october if the, the information that that amy that you're requesting comes back from webster in a favorable position we could have a two-minute special meeting just run this vote tell them get on board so that we could have this pension board could have a defensible position that yes we have hired somebody you know, dragging your feet. I don't know that it's necessary to drag our feet until October. No, that would not be the idea. And hopefully we could uh, piggyback, piggyback that with the investment policy statement that George will finish that by then as well. So we could just well, no, not. You know, it. if George is dragging his feet, but Webster's moving quick, we could do the Webster thing next week in five minutes. Sure. I'm just, you know, I guess I am a little anxious about not having it. I, I want to make sure 
that I don't lose everything that I think I have. <clears throat> you know, I don't, I don't want to get named in a lawsuit. I don't want, I know, Amy, you're going to say we have um, the, uh, the liability coverage, but I, I just don't want to be part of that if we can make that problem just go away. Yes, we have everything we're supposed to have, and we did it as quickly as we can. That, I, that would make me a little bit more comfortable. Hey, you got more than you had when I started. You had no insurance Absolutely. even when I started. And, you're, you're right, you know? <laughs> and we uncovered a huge liability there that was just like never considered. That was an unpleasant surprise. Yeah, it sure was. Let's make an exception again and, you know, not know what we're doing. But that one's gone. Okay, I'm cool with that. This fiduciary thing, I just think we had to. We have a five-minute meeting. We get a quorum. We vote on one thing. We shut down. We're good. Yeah. All right. Um, I think that's it then. Uh, so motion to adjourn. I move that we adjourn this meeting. Second. All members in favor? Aye. 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 We are adjourned. Thanks, Good night, everybody. Good night, everybody.